Hello, this is the fourth in a series of recordings related to um, two-level factorial designs. And before viewing the video, you should have watched the previous three videos and you should have read through the uh, two-level uh, factorial design notes part two. In this section, we're going to talk about an issue that comes up with these two-level designs. And that is, and I often get asked this question when I teach these designs to engineers and scientists, we essentially only have two levels of each factor, a low level and a high level. And given there's only a low level and a high level, the only relationship we can fit between the response in each factor is a straight line. In other words, the only model possible is a straight line uh, relating each factor to the response. And they'd say, well, how can you justify that the linear assumption is valid? And it's a good point. It is not necessarily a good assumption in all cases. Well, it turns out one of the ways we can test our assumption of a linear relationship is by the addition of what we call center runs. For continuous factors, a center run is simply a trial in which each of the k factors is simultaneously set to the midpoint of its range. So on the minus 1, plus 1 scale, all factors would be set at 0, and we'd call it a center run. Okay. And these center points have a couple of really nice uses. Number one, as I said, they let us check for lack of fit, that is, to check to see if the linear relationship holds. And two, it actually is a nice way to replicate the experiment. So instead of replicating the factorial trials, quite often what we'll do is we'll just replicate the center points, and we'll do no other replication. Okay. So to give you an example, let's suppose we do a 2 squared factorial. Okay, and you see at the bottom in the picture, okay, each of the corner points would represent the factorial response. Okay, so that's the 2 squared factorial. But then notice we did a group of trials at the center of the region. These are why they're called center points. And notice the average of the center points, that's y bar c, is very different than the average of the factorial points. And that indicates that the linear assumption most likely doesn't hold. If the linear assumption holds, then the average of the center points should be approximately the same as the average of the factorial points. So when you average the factorial points, that average is the center of the plane that is the response surface. So a natural test, for lack of fit, is to actually compare the average of the factorial points to the average of the center points and see if they agree. If they do not, then the linear assumption does not hold. Okay. So we tend to call this a lack of fit test. And in particular, in the case I just showed, it's a test for curvature in the response surface. So as I said, if no curvature exists, then the average of the center points should be about the same as the average response at the factorial points. But we also tend to replicate the center points. And this actually gives us a way estimate the variance of the response. And that is, it gives us a way to replicate and estimate experimental error. And what's important, we call it pure error, because the variation among the center points is purely noise. And it does not matter what model we fit, the variation among those center points is always the same. So when we estimate experimental error from center points only, we say it's a pure estimate. It's completely independent of any model that might have been fit. Okay. Now, 
what happens if your design allows for a test for lack of fit, then it is possible to take the sum of squares error in the ANOVA table and break it into two parts. Mathematically, how this is done depends upon the design and the type of effect you're looking for. But given it's possible to do this partitioning of the sum of squares error in the ANOVA table, we can have one portion we call the sum of squares lack of fit. That is variation that is due to the model not fitting. And then the sum of squares pure error, that is variation that is purely noise. So the sum of squares pure error must be estimated from replicates. And in our case, it's going to be estimated from the replicated center points. Excuse me, I will not go through all the details, but it's actually possible to construct a test for lack of fit. In our case, we call this a one degree of freedom test <coughs> for lack of fit, and that's because it's based upon one comparison. Comparing the average of the factorial points to the average of the center points so our test has one degree of freedom. In other words, we have one estimate of curvature based upon that difference in means. So you can construct a test. <coughs> and I want to point out, the jump software does lack of fit tests automatically. It will only do them if it's possible. So it's not a request you can make. The software looks at your design structure and if a test is possible, it will do it. So I'm going to go over to jump and illustrate a lack of fit test. So this is an experiment studying the wear of a tool that is used to cut steel. <clears throat> and there, there are three factors, A, B, and C. These are parameters of the cutting process. And the measured response is tool life. And this is measured in some measure of how much cutting the tool did. I do not remember the exact details. But notice the people who did the experiment decided to add five center points. I've separated the center points here uh, for emphasis. In general, the center points would be done at random uh, for the whole design. But here, I wanted you to see the structure, so I sorted it. Just remember, in practice, uh, it would be uh, it would not be sorted. It'd be completely random. So I'm going to go to the Analyze menu, Fit Model. Okay, Tool Life is our measured response. I highlight A, B, and C in the Select Columns windows. Our three factors, and under Macros, I'm going to fit a full factorial. So I have a three-way interaction, three two-ways, and the main effects. And then the screening, uh, effect screening emphasis automatically appears. So I'm going to run the model. Okay. Notice in the actual by predicted plot, okay, blow it up, you can actually see the center points. And the average of those center points, if you just visually took an, you know, tried to average them, fall right in line with the factorial points. That would indicate there really is no curvature. The average at the center is pretty close to the average of the factorials because, again, it falls right in line in the plot. Okay. However, we can go down and notice jump gives us a lack of fit test. So take a look at the sum of squares error okay, in the ANOVA table. Since we can do a lack of fit test, jump is able to take that sum of squares error okay, and break it into two parts. A lack of fit, by the way, this lack of fit is the test for curvature I just showed in the notes, and an estimate of pure error. And then an F test is constructed for lack of fit. 
the null hypothesis is always there is no lack of fit. I know that's awkward terminology, that under the null hypothesis, the model fits. Well, notice the F ratio is small, the P value is large, therefore, we proceed under the assumption that there is no um, lack of fit. In other words, there appears to be no curvature, and this is in agreement with the visual display in the actual by predicted plot. But lack of fit tests can be expanded beyond just um, the need for accommodating curvature. We can test for lack of interactions. Notice in our model, there's a three-way interaction, and it looks to be significant. And by the way, in machining operations, three-way interactions tend to occur quite frequently. They're very dynamic processes. So for illustration, I'm going to go back to the model dialog window, and I'm going to remove the three-way interaction. Okay. So I'm going to show you the analysis. On the left is the original, which included the three-way interaction. Okay. On the right okay, is the model without the three-way interaction. So the variation in that three-way interaction, since it's removed from the model, is automatically added to experimental error. And then notice, again, down below, the error is broken down into a sum of squares lack of fit and a sum of squares error. And this time there are two degrees of freedom. So this test is testing for curvature plus the need for a three-way interaction. It's a combined test. We've already tested for curvature and didn't find any. So what this appears to be is a lack of fit due to the failure to include the three-way interaction. Okay. So lack of fit tests can be generalized to more than just looking for curvature. So on the left is our test for curvature, no evidence of it. And on the right is our test for the need for the three-way interaction okay, and uh, for curvature. Since there's no curvature lack of fit, we now know that we need that three-way interaction. Okay? So I'm going to show you one more example. Okay. And let's see, close that for now. And see if I can find it here. This is another experiment. And this is a, a chemical engineering example where they're trying to maximize the yield of a synthesis process. And I'm going to focus on yield two, which is the actual uh, response. Again, notice okay, that the design is a two to the two or two squared factorial, four unique runs. And the engineers elected to do five center points. And if you just eyeball this, it sure looks like the average of the center points is quite a bit higher than the average of the factorial points. But we're going to find out because we're going to do the analysis and then we'll see if jump can detect a significant lack of fit. So go to analyze fit model and yield two is the actual response. We highlight time and temperature in the select columns window. Fit a full factorial model. Again, I'm going to change emphasis to screening. And we run the model. OK, this time notice it's very obvious the center points are very, very different than the factorial points. So if we go down to our lack of fit test, okay, notice the overall uh, sum of squares error is about 62. And when we break that down into pure error, so pure error, again, is literally just the sample variance of the five center points. 
It's actually pretty small. What that says is there's very little noise among these five replicate measurements. So most of the sum of squares error is due to curvature, a lack of fit. We take a look at our test and we conclude, yes, there is strong curvature in the relationship between time, temperature, and yield. Okay. So at this point, what we've established is that our model doesn't fit. And what that implies is the sum of squares error incorporates both noise, the traditional experimental error, and a systematic failure of the model to fit. That is, the sum of squares error has been greatly inflated by the fact that the model systematically doesn't fit the data. As a result, all of the uh, tests in the parameter estimates table are invalid. The tests are based upon a measure of noise, not on the lack of fit. So at this point, we're basically stuck. Our linear model does not fit, and the only way we can proceed is to augment this design with additional runs that can accommodate adding, for instance, squared terms to the model. We're not ready to talk about augmenting designs at this point. We'll do that later in the course. But the problem we have is there is curvature. The linear assumption is not holding. And typically, squared terms, if they could be added to the model, would be all that would be needed. Now, you might look at the design and say, yeah, but time and temperature are run at three levels. Yes, but they're run at three levels in a systematic way, not a factorial way. So if I put a squared term like time squared and temp squared in the model, okay, literally all you would have to do is take the settings of time and square them. In fact, why don't I just do that to show you? So I'm going to call this one time squared. And I'll call the other one temp square. And I'll put in a formula. So time square is just time times time. And temp square, again, I'll put in a formula, is just temp times temp. Notice they're identical. So if I estimate time squared or temp squared, I get exactly the same value. So very shortly in the course, we're going to say that time squared and temp squared are fully aliased. In other words, this design does not allow me to uniquely estimate a squared term in time and a squared term in temp. If I were to put a squared term in the model, it would represent both of them at the same time, and we'd have no idea what the real effect is. So the only way we can proceed at this point is to simply try to add more trials to the experiment that will let us estimate squared terms. So we're kind of stuck at this point. Um, since our model doesn't fit, it's pointless to try to use. Uh, and by the way, it's substantial lack of fit. So it's pointless to use this model to try to predict performance. So in this video, we've talked about center points, uh, their use as replicates, and their use to check for curvature. And we've talked about the issue of lack of fit and lack of fit testing.